Shabbat Shalom, everyone. This is the oh, be, the 21st Yom, or the 21st day of the 12th month, and it is the Shabbat. We're also on the 5th of March <clears throat> for the Gregorian calendar, and we're taking a little segue from what we've been reading with the recognitions of Clement and the preaching and teaching of Kepha to go over the calendar information so that we're more familiar with it. Before we read what's on the screen right here, I wanted to share something I haven't been able to add to this yet. I was just reading this morning a section from the community rule and right in the beginning of it, at the bottom of the first section in column one, it's actually um, part of line 14 through line 15. It has something that's relevant to what you see on the screen, why we should not intercalate, which means add days between the years or to add a leap day or a leap week or anything of that nature. So I'm going to start at the top of the paragraph there. It's, it's, it would be at line 11. It says, all who volunteer for his truth are to bring the full measure of their knowledge, strength, and wealth into the yachad or united into one of Elohim. And if you think about this, this is a foreshadow of what the emissaries were doing first in the land, where they all sold things and have everything in common. And then what they were setting up with the assemblies at large. And then in a fuller culmination of that, what you can see Charles Finney preaching and teaching during the revivals in America where he was telling everybody that you can't consider anything that you have your own. So it's the same principle here. But it says, all who volunteer for his truth are to bring the full measure of their knowledge, strength, and wealth into the Yahad of Elohim. Thus, they will purify their knowledge in the verity or truth of Elohim's laws, properly exercise their strength according to the, the perfection of his ways, and likewise their wealth by the canon of his righteous counsel. They are not to deviate in the smallest detail from any of Elohim's words as they apply to their own time. And then this is the relevant section. They are neither to advance their set-apart times nor to postpone any of their prescribed festivals. They shall turn aside from his unerring laws neither to the right nor the left. And then it goes on into the initiation into the Yachad and what they have to do. But that's not relevant for us right now. So this is actually an email that I put together and I, I kind of skimmed through it when I was sharing with the Kahal Elohim or the congregation of Elohim that Brother Jackson Safant is running. And um, I'm just going to go ahead and read this through, and then we'll cover any questions that we might have at the end. And you can feel free to ask questions as we go or to input something that might be in another part of Scripture that confirms or goes along with it as well. All right. This is why we should not intercalate. <clears throat> with the release of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have, for the first time in well over a thousand years, the means of knowing how to keep track of time based only on what is written. Before getting into the details, let me share a part of the introduction for the calendar information in a new translation of the Dead Sea Scrolls here. Quote, calendars or writings that presuppose them comprise a very substantial percentage of the Dead Sea cache. Indeed, as stated in the introduction, adherence to a peculiar calendar is the thread that runs through hundreds of the Dead Sea Scrolls. More than any other single element, the calendar binds these works together. It is the calendar that makes the scrolls a collection. The calendar is the intentional element, unquote. And that was really just to show that it was the central theme of all the scrolls, the, the concept of the calendar was everywhere in it. And once you get that that was part of the library 
that belonged to the Zadok Kohanim. Then you can see the mutilation that happened by those that rejected the truth when they started following after errant systems. This is one thing about the scrolls few seem to keep in mind when determining who wrote them is that internal evidence shows beyond doubt the sons of Zadok, all Kohanim, were the authors and keepers of the scrolls. Now, they talk about the Essenes, and they make them out to be some monist, monastic order, and that's intentional. If you look more into who actually overthrew things and what's going on, that they're projecting. But the ones that separated from those walking in error that went off into the wilderness to keep his will according to the, their own conscience, that's a type and picture of things that were going to come in the future, if anyone can see that plainly. <clears throat> but moving on. It says, with that being said, the scrolls which include among them all the common scriptures and apocryphal writings in the original 1611 and the Septuagint, what is called first Enoch or Hanok, Yobelim, Jubilees, and more, simply put, it is the remains of the library of the servants of Yahuwah. And I'll put in the, the book of Yasher or Jasher, the common ones, the two translations or versions that are available today, were nowhere found among any of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they actually contradict what was found there. That these Kohanim are witnessed about in his word, and that we should take heed of what is in here, can be seen in scripture. Thus said the Adon Yahuwah, No son of a foreigner, uncircumcised in heart or uncircumcised in flesh, comes into my set-apart place. Even any son of a foreigner who is among the children of Yisrael, and the Luiim who went far from me when Yisrael went astray, who strayed away from me after their idols, they shall bear their crookedness or inequity, and they were attendants in my set-apart place as gatekeepers of the house and attendants of the house, slaying the ascending offering and the slaughtering for the people, and standing before them to attend to them. Because they attended to them before their idols and became a stumbling block of crookedness to the house of Yisrael. Therefore, I have lifted my hand in an oath against them, declares the master Yahuwah, that they shall bear their inequity and not come near me to serve me as Kohen, or to serve as my Kohen rather, nor come near any of that which is set apart to me. So, this is talking about, like, in the wilderness, you had Korok and the 250 that rose up against Moshe and Aaron and the rightful, the established worship, and wanted to do contrary. Reuben and Reuben's children also rose up with them, all right, in conspiracy. These are foreshadows of things that would happen in the future as well. This is about the apostate preachers. Those that are joined unto him, the Luiim, right? But turn aside and act as stumbling blocks to the people. However, it says, it starts to talk about the ones that stay true shortly. But it says, nor into my, this is what he does for them. He doesn't let them draw, or he doesn't let them draw, um, sorry, come near to anything which is set apart to me, nor into the most set apart place. And they shall bear their shame and their abominations which they have done, but I shall make them those who guard the duty of the house for all its work and for all that has been done in it. And that was the same thing that happened in history. Those that were guarding the house or the, the truth in them were also the ones that were teaching apostasy, but it was later made evident that these things are so. Yet the Kohanim, the Luiim, the sons of Zadok, who guarded the duty of my set-apart place when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall draw near to me to serve me. 
and shall stand before me to bring to me the fat and the blood, declares the master Yahuwah. They shall enter my set-apart place, and they shall draw near to my table to serve me, and they shall guard my charge. And I didn't add the text that isn't relevant to the calendar information, which is approving who the, the sons of Zadok are and then what they were to be teaching, which is right here. And they are to teach my people the difference between the set apart and the profane and to make them know what is unclean and clean. And they are to stand as judges in a dispute and judge it according to my right rulings. And they are to guard my Torah or instructions and my laws in all my appointed times and my set apart Sabbaths. That's from Yechezkiel or Ezekiel 44, 9 through 16 and 23 through 24. The contribution that you offer up to Yahuwah is 25,000 cubits in length and 10,000 in width. And of these is set apart, or is the set apart contribution for the Kohanim. On the north, 25,000 cubits, and on the west, 25,000 in width, and on the east, 10,000 in width, and on the south, 25,000 in length. And the set-apart place of Yahuwah shall be in its midst for the Kohanim of the sons of Zadok, who are set apart, who did guard my charge, who did not go astray when the children of Yisrael went astray, as the Luiim went astray. And this is Yechezkiel or Ezekiel 48, 9 through 11. Again, this is about the legitimacy of listening to the sons of Zadok. In the Dead Sea Scrolls themselves, this witness is expounded on. It says, through it, the first members of the covenant sinned and were delivered up to the sword because they forsook the covenant of Elohim and chose their own will and walked in the stubbornness of their hearts, each of them doing his own will. Yet with the remnant which held fast to the commandments of Elohim, he made his covenant with Yisrael forever, revealing to them the hidden things in which all Yisrael had gone astray. He unfolded before them his Kodesh Sabbaths and his esteemed feasts, the testimonies of his righteousness and the ways of his truth, and the desires of his will, which a man must do in order to live. And they dug a well rich in water, and he who despises it shall not live. Yet they wallowed in the sin of man and in the ways of uncleanness, and they said, This is ours. But Elohim in his wonderful mysteries forgave them their sin and pardoned their wickedness. And he built them a sure house in Yisrael, whose like has never existed from former times till now. Those who hold fast to it are destined to live forever, and all the esteem of Adam shall be theirs. As Elohim ordained for them by the hand of the foreteller Yechezkiel, saying the Kohanim, the Luiim, and the sons of Zadok who kept my charge, or who kept the charge of my Hekel, when the children of Israel strayed from me, they shall offer me fat and blood. Not quite an exact quote there, and you'll see right here, this part is added by the authors. It's not actually in the text. And if you pay attention to who the Louis are and the fact that they were the ones that didn't keep the charge that he was rebuking, then you, you can see that that's not actually true. But we'll continue. The Kohanim are the converts of Yisrael who departed from the land of Yahuda and those who joined them. The sons of Zadok are the elect of Yisrael, the men called by name who shall stand at the end of days. Behold the exact list of their names according to their generations and the time when they lived and the number of their trials and the years of their sojourn and the exact list of their deeds. And then it breaks off. This part was added by the translators. It says, they were the men of set-apartness, or Kodeshah, 
whom Elohim forgave and who declared right the righteous and condemned the wicked. And until the age is completed, according to the number of those years, all who enter after them shall do according to the, that interpretation of the law in which the first were instructed. According to the covenant which Elohim made with the forefathers, forgiving their sins, so shall he forgive their sins also. But when the age is completed, according to the number of those years, there shall be no more joining to the house of Yahuda, but each man shall stand on his watchtower. The wall is built, the boundary far removed, which is a quote from Micah chapter 7, verse 2. It's speaking of when, after the destruction of Yahushalayim, and there is no more standing with Yahuda, but the assemblies around the world is where their watchtowers were built, right? The walls built, the boundary far removed. And this was a quote, <clears throat> sorry, from 4Q266 through 4Q268, part of the Damascus document. It's actually a section of the exhortation. All right, so the Dead Sea Scrolls plot time using five different cycles. And these five cycles are found throughout different scrolls that were among the collection, which we'll cover in just a moment. But it's a 364 yom or day solar cycle, a three year, 354 day lunar cycle, a six year cycle for the Kohanim to all serve an equal amount, which when you look at the list, if any of you have the Kohen order from Jerry Morris, you just look at the first set of six, the same number it starts with is the same one it ends with and it has a, the cycle so everyone works in even a number of times in their sh shift before it repeats itself and that leads to a sabbatical year right 49 years or seven sevens for the Yob yobelim cycle and a 294 year cycle of six yobelim which would then repeat and this 294 year cycle is specifically it's going through who's serving during the time of the uh like shekinah and gamal shekinah and gamal are 22 and 10 22 and 10 when they serve is when the full moon would have its th three year sign that would repeat itself which is going to happen at the beginning of next year on the 16th of March. It happened in 2019. It happened in 2016. It happened in 2013. It's the pattern that Jerry Morris first discovered and shared, and we've been tracking it since then. Or I've personally been tracking it since 2016 with a group of other people. But this is obviously, if this is so, showing five different cycles over a 294 year period. With so many cycles over so many years, it would be impossible to intercalate unless we wait until the last cycle be completely through. When looking for the new year, the key is found in observing the phenomenon he tells us will be in these times, equal parts light and dark, having a full moon every third year as the sign or oath the moon makes and seeing the signs that accompany each season as shown in Hanok or Enoch chapter 82. Although we only have two of the four seasons expounded on. The calendar, as far as I am aware, was first made known by our late brother, Jerry Morris, who started tracking these signs in 2013 and teaching shortly after. I've personally kept this calendar since 2016, which had a full moon on the first of the month, as it did again in 2019. We are expecting this once again in 2022. Anyone can view his teaching on this found here, and there's a link for it.
He also personally wrote out the 294-year cycle of the Kohen serving in the temple, or Hekel, and they made it into a PDF I will share in another email. I'm pretty sure I shared it with everyone here, and if anyone does want that, I can send it to you in an email. Other people might have it as well that can also share. I don't know if it's available, uploaded anywhere to just download, though. Some scrolls, like 4Q252 through 254A, titled Commentaries on Genesis by scholars, show familiar accounts, in this case the flood, with exact dates that line up with the unchanging calendar already shown for the last few weeks, and that was in the other group. Others are specific in content and meant to sync the luminaries, show what the Kohen's family would be serving when, and when signs or certain phenomenon would occur, like the full moon on the first of the year, which happens every third year, and was tracked in such scrolls as 4Q319, calendar of the Shamayim signs, or heavenly signs, as they put it in the English. Before moving into the proofs in the writings that plainly say that we do not add more than 364 yamim or days to a year, not to disturb the years out of their place, we should cover a topic that is a point of contention among the so-called scholars familiar with the Dead Sea Scrolls. In the writings on the moon, two words are used for the full moon and crescent, chodesh and dok, or doka respectively there is a debate on which is for or which is which for some reason they say they don't really know what the word doka which is dalit wa kuf he means and argue it could be crescent moon or full chodesh chet yo or chet wa dalit sheen is the other word and it is either a case of miscomprehension based on preconceived assumptions or intentional disinformation on their part. It could be that they look to the opinions of the Yahudim who count their Chodeshim or months, renewals, if you will, <clears throat> excuse me, by the Yarach or moon, not acknowledging that they are two different words. A modern scholar has tried to tackle this subject against the accepted standards of our days and has written books, articles, videos, or made videos, and more on the topic. And here's one example, and this is a, an article from the Sun's Times called From the Sun to the Moon that was about Rachel Elior, if any of you are familiar. This is not to rely on man. Scripture makes it clear that those who reject truth get deception as our reward. And we can find this quote in the Apostolic Constitutions on the topic. This is from Book 5, Chapter 17. It says, It is therefore your duty, brethren, who are redeemed by the precious blood of Mashiach, to observe the yamim or days of the Passover exactly, with all care, after the vernal equinox, because this is the last day of the year, right? Least you be obliged to keep the memorial of the one passion twice in a year. Keep it once only in a year for him that died but once. Do not you yourselves compute but keep it when your brethren of the circumcision do so. And then I didn't add the text that was not relevant to the topic. This is, but no longer be careful to keep the feast with the Yahudim, for we have now no communion with them, for they have been led astray in regard to the calculation itself, which they think they accomplished perfectly, that they may be led astray on every hand and be fenced off from the truth. And I put, these would be the Yahudim that rejected our Mashiach, who is the truth. They were intentionally led astray because they rejected what is. As can be seen above, early believers were enjoined to follow those of the circumcision that believed, 
which would have been a host of the Kohanim, if you recall. And the word of Elohim spread, and the number of the taught ones increased greatly in Yerushalayim, and a great many of the Kohanim were obedient to the belief. Maase or Acts 6, verse 7. Barnabas, you may recall, was also of the sons of Louis. Back to the point, the two words, while they may be ambiguous to modern scholars, were, well, were known well enough before the intentional obfuscation by the Counter-Reformation and their campaign of disinformation. The following is found in Ernest Klein's A Comprehensive Etymological Dictionary of the Hebrew Language for Readers of English. It should be apparent after seeing these definitions that dok should stand for the crescent moon and Chodesh should stand for the full moon. And this is Dok. It, it's on page 118. It means to consider, to be exact. All right. Dik, when you have Dalit Yod Kuf, page 123, is to be exact, be precise. He calculated exactly. And then Dak, when you don't have the Wa there, which is common for them to have the definitions broken up like this when it's all related to the same word, right? The more you study that, or if you've ever listened to Eric Bissell on his uh, Erictology, he uses this dictionary exclusively, and he's hopping all over the place to show you the meaning of a word because this is how it's done, okay? But DAC, page 130, is thin, lean, small, fine, minute, tender, weak. In contrast, Chodesh, page 209, is to be new, to be renewed, renovated, restored. Month. Unfortunately, the use of Chodesh for the full moon is used to legitimize the use of the moon for reckoning the months. And this is something that is in the scrolls it will go through the lunar phases for a three-year period. And it talks about the Chodesh or the full moon and the Dok, the crescent, to give you the points on, on the calendar when that happens through the three-year cycle. It's also quite reminiscent of what you can find in the book of Hanok when it's talking about the luminary, where it has the 14 parts and it gets one seventh part each yom, and then it has the full moon one seventh part it decreases and then it has the dark moon so it's not inconsistent with these things but it does not mean that it's a month and that it's talking about when a month begins that's nowhere in the context of the scrolls that's the point it says unfortunately the use of chodesh for the full moon is used to legitimize the use of the moon for reckoning the months but this is something resoundingly refuted in the scrolls themselves and only supported by modern adherence to error. The word Chodesh is also used for the word month, but with no association with the moon whatsoever. It always has the sense of being renewed or restored. And Chodesh is even used in the Psalms when it says a new psalm he sung in gladness of heart. That's a Chodesh. Sheer, a new song. But moving on, is that there are four Chodeshim or new months that are what we call Sabbaths and what Yobelim or the Book of Jubilees calls Yamim or days of remembrance, which are ordained forever. One witness, not intentionally but inadvertently, is the account of the Psalms and songs of Dawid as recorded in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the importance of this is showing that there's only four Chodeshim, or four new months that we actually have as Sabbaths. It's not 12. Some people want to keep every new month as a Shabbat, but that's nowhere, nowhere in the scrolls. <clears throat> so this is an account of David or Dawid's poems. Dawid, son of Yeshai, or Jesse, was a prudent and brilliant, like the light of the sun, a scribe, intelligent and perfect in all his ways before Elohim and men. 
Yahuwah gave him an intelligent and brilliant Ruach, and he wrote 3,600 psalms and 364 songs to sing before the altar for the daily perpetual sacrifice for all the Yamim or days of the year, and 52 songs for the Sabbath offerings, which we have the scrolls, a few of them, called the songs of the Sabbath sacrifice. And we only have up to 13 of those, and it's most of them are in fragments. <clears throat> but it says, and 52 songs for the Sabbath offerings, and 30 songs for the new months, for the feast days, and for the day of atonement. So if you do the math, there's 25 feast days. There's one yom of atonement. And then you have four left for the total of 30. Okay. In all, the songs which he uttered were 446 and four songs to make music on behalf of those stricken by evil Ruach or their spirits. In all, there were 4,050. All these he uttered through foretelling, which was given him from before the Most High. That goes in line with other things you can see where our Mashiach said that all things that were written in the Torah and the foretellers and the Psalms has to be fulfilled concerning him. There's one letter, I think it's a letter to Marcellus. I, I might be butchering the name, but it's on the interpretation of the Psalms, and it does a wonderful job of showing our Mashiach throughout that. So it's pretty interesting read. But this was from 4Q88, column 27, Apocryphal Psalms of Dawid. If you give me one moment. A second witness to the Chodeshim is seen in Yobelim, where we will also find an affirmation of 364 days in a year, four remembrance days, the divisions between each being 52 weeks, right? And a refuge, or sorry, 91 days between each, 52 weeks in the year. And a refutation of using the moon or to intercalate any days between years. This is long, but covers a lot of information. Yobelim chapter 6, starting on verse 23. And on the new month of the first month, and on the new month of the fourth month, and on the new month of the seventh month, and on the new month of the tenth month are Yamim or days of remembrance, and the days of the seasons in the four divisions of the year. These are written and ordained as a testimony forever. And Noah ordained them for himself as feasts for the generations forever, so that they have become thereby a memorial unto him. And on the new month of the first month, he was bidden to make for himself an ark. And on that, the earth became dry, and he opened and saw the earth. And on the new month of the fourth month, the mouths of the deeps, or sorry, the mouths of the depths of the abyss beneath were closed. And on the new month of the seventh month, all the mouths of the abysses of the earth were opened. They were closed when the flood was full on the earth and the, the waters were raging for 150 days right and then it was opened when they started to descend again into the deep or outside of the firmament if you will <clears throat> these four are shabbats yes these are the four remembrance yamim that are shabbats these are the four chodeshim where it says from new month to new month and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me. These are the ones that he's speaking of. They're going to be forever perpetual. It says, and on the new month of the seventh month, all the mouths of the abysses of the earth were opened and the waters began to descend into them. 
And on the new month of the tenth month, the tops of the mountains were seen, and Noah was glad. And on this account, he ordained them for himself as feasts for a memorial forever, and thus are they ordained. And they placed them on the Shemaim tablets. Each had 13 weeks from one to another their memorial, from the first to the second, and from the second to the third, and from the third to the fourth. And all the days of the commandment will be 52 weeks of days and the entire year complete. Thus it is engraved and ordained on the Shemaim tablets, and there is no neglecting for a single year or from year to year. And command you, the children of Israel, that they observe the years according to this reckoning, 364 days, and will constitute a complete year, and they will not disturb its time from its days and from its feasts, for everything will fall out in them according to their testimony, and they will not leave out any day nor disturb any feasts. But if they do neglect and do not observe them according to his commandment, then they will disturb all their seasons, and the years will be dislodged from this, and they will neglect their ordinances. And all the children of Israel will forget and will not find the path of the years, and will forget the new months and seasons and Sabbaths, and they will go wrong as to all the order of the years. For I know, and from henceforth will I declare it unto you, that it is not of my own devising. For the book is written before me, and on the Shemaim tablets the division of days is ordained. Lest they forget the feasts of the covenant, and walk according to the feasts of the nations, after their error, and after their ignorance. For there will be those, or sorry, for there will be those who will assuredly make observations of the moon how it disturbs the seasons and comes in from year to year 10 days too soon before i read the rest of this real quick the first known moon worship and having it set up was from babylon that's kind of a given but the first mixture with the children was amongst the greeks it's common knowledge that the greeks kept a lunar calendar it's not so common knowledge that the Greek people were a mixture of Hebrews and the sons of Yepheth, Yahweh, to be specific, but that is literally true. There were migrations of Hebrews out of Egypt and settling city-states before Moshe took them out. It was known in secular or profane history, and it was recorded by the Hebrews as well and carried down in different means. But they were the first to do it. And Moshe would have known that in the times that he was speaking of this, because it would have been contemporary. Then you have the example, after the exile of the Northern Kingdom, you can look at Sharon Turner's history of the Anglo-Saxons, the Northern Kingdoms that went apostatized, kept a lunar calendar, same thing. And then you go further on, with the dispersion of the Yahudim into Babylon, or after that time, after the time of the captivity here, they reject the truth and they go apostate and then they now have a lunar calendar, a point of contention still with our maker to the point where that was what he used in his, uh, everyone gets judged according to their ways and deeds. When you look at the anti mashiach for Dummies videos at bringing the Yahudim back into the land after they're being cast out of it. It happens during the normal course of a lunar cycle in years. So it's about 28.3 years for each major event on their coming back into the land. It's rather interesting. And it goes along with the Yahudim or Yahuda being given the kingdom, which was being set up for our Mashiach. And it goes along with the, the, the moon phases. It's something we've covered on a different topic but it all lines up with the, the reign or the kingdom, which in the Testament of Naphtali, Yahuda takes hold of the moon. He was given the kingdom. Uh, in the genealogy of our Mashiach, 
in the book of Matanyahu. It has 14 generations from Abraham to Dawid, or from the crescent to the full moon, and then 14 generations from Dawid to the Babylonian captivity, and then 14 generations from the return to the coming of our Mashiach. So it follows the lunar phases on when these events were happening in that generational thing for the monarchy, which was the same. If you watch the anti mishiach for Dummies videos as well, you will see that lunar eclipses over certain events were protenting the fall of kingdoms and reigns and things that had to, they had to do with the monarchies. So it's the same thing being shown in the skies above and written about as well. <clears throat> And you can tie that all the way back into the creation account parable with the fourth day, the, with the making of the moon. It lines up with these things in the parable form that we can talk about some other time, but we've shared it before too. So not to get distracted here. Verse 37, it says, For this reason, the years will come upon them when they will disturb and make an abomination the yom of testimony and an unclean day, a feast day, and they will confound all the days, the set apart with the unclean, and the unclean with the set apart. I'm sorry, the unclean yom, or day, with the set apart. For they will go wrong as to the months, and Sabbaths, and feasts, and Yobelim. For this reason I command and protest, or witness, to you, that you may protest to them, for after your death, your children will disturb them so that they will not make the year 364 days only. And for this reason, they will go wrong as to the new months and seasons and Sabbaths and festivals, and they will eat all kinds of blood with all kinds of flesh. It says, see also 4Q328, Kohen service as the seasons change to see a 364 day year. So now I'm giving you multiple witnesses to confirm the things that are in the calendar that you can look for yourself, okay? Everyone can do that. So that's 4Q328, Kohen service as the seasons change, all right, for the 364 day year, and how it is broken down into four seasons of 13 weeks each, 91 days in each. For the fourth day of the week start, it can be seen in 4Q394, Section A, the Sabbaths and festivals of the year. And 4Q319, calendar of the Shamayim signs. This latter scroll also shows the 49-year Yobel and 294-year six Yobelim cycles. Lastly, scrolls 4Q320 through 321A, called the synchronized calendars, shows the six-year Kohen cycle. Below is another witness to the year not shifting, as well as the synchronization of the sun and moon, something that happens every third year and does not account for intercalation of any kind. This is from Hanok or Enoch 72, starting on verse 32. On that day, the night shortens and becomes nine parts, and the day, nine parts. Then the night becomes equal with the yom, and the yamim, or days, of the year add up to exactly 364 yamim, or days. The length of the days and the night or sorry, the length of the day and the night, as well as the shortness of the day and the night, are determined by the course of the circuit of the sun to distinguish by it, or sorry, and distinguished by it, meaning the sun has all authority. The circuit becomes longer or shorter day by day and night by night, respectively. Thus, this is the order for the course of the movement and the settlement of the sun, that great luminary which is called the sun, for the duration of the years, or Shemesh, if you know, that word is also the, the steadfast servant that runs his course. 
for the duration of the years of the creation in respect to its going in and coming out. It is that very luminary which manifests itself in its appearance as Yahuwah has commanded that it shall come in and go out, or shall come out and go in rather, in this manner. And that was to show that it's equal day and night, and then that's the end of the year. If you go back to the beginning of that chapter, it starts on the immediate point after that, where it's incrementally gaining light for 91 days until that 91st day is the longest day of the year. And then if you break it down and do the math, because there's 18 parts, if you break that down for 18 parts in 24 hour period, each day you get roughly three minutes, six seconds of light added or taken away from the previous one, a minute 33 each morning and evening. This is Hanok or Enoch chapter 74, <clears throat> starting on verse 11. It says, the gain of the sun and of the stars turn out to be 10 days in three years. 10 yamim every year add up to 30 yamim or 30 days. And the moon falls behind the sun and the stars for 30 days. And they bring about all the years punctuously. Or puncti I can't say that right right now punctuously, punctu <laughs> I'm sorry, so that they forever neither gain upon nor fall behind their fixed positions for a single year or a single yom day, but they convert the year with punctuous righteousness into 364 yamin. Here we can see the signs to look for after each season turns from half a month to a month away we will see little signs of the new seasons, but we see all as stated after they start. This is something I have only been tracking since 2018 or 2019 and, you know, maybe later. But I, I have to double check in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They might have more information. I looked a little bit and I didn't find anything where it completes the seasons here for the signs that you can look for. It usually happens at the beginning of the last month of each season. You can get telltale signs of the new season ahead, but you don't see all the effects of what you see written until after it is the actual official start of the season. And then they manifest across the board. At least I found that to be true where, where I'm at. It might, depending on your location your and your climate, you might have more in warmer climates, it's going to manifest sooner that spring is around than it will in northern latitudes, if you know what I mean. But verse 13, it says, And these are the names of the leaders which divide the four seasons of the years which are fixed. Mikael, Hala, Amamelech, Meleul, and Narel. And this is the messenger of L. I, I can't remember this one. It had to do with something about the bright, something of, of the sovereign. I can't remember that one. And this is the lamp of L. Nar L is the lamp of L. This is the names of those who lead them are Adnarul, Yalusis L, or Yalasus L, and Ulmiel. These three follow the leaders of their orders, as well as the four which follow after the three leaders of the orders, which follow after those leaders of the stations that divide the four seasons of the year. So the four leaders are, they head the four seasons of the year, or the Chodesh Yamim, if you will. And then you have the leaders of the months, and then the ones that over each day, all right, I put it right here. And then you have the, the ones that head the ends of the season or the signs, like the, the longest day of the year, equal day and night, shortest day of the year, equal day and night, right? And then I, I put that right here. It says one leader for each season, then three follow each one for the three months and in each, and then the four leaders that end the seasons, okay? It says at the very beginning, Malkiel, whose name is called 
Tamayen, or Tamayen, and the sun rises and rules all the days of his authority, during which he reigns are 91 days. And these are the signs of the days which become manifest during the period of his authority. Sweat, this is what you'd experience in the spring. Sweat, heat, and dryness. All the trees bear fruit, and leaves grow on all trees. There will be a good harvest, rose flowers, and all the flowers which grow in the field. But the winter tree shall wither. And these are the names of the leaders which are their subordinates. Barkael, Zal, Zaleb Sael, and another additional one, a captain of a thousand named Huliasaf, or Hiluyasaf. The days of the authority of this one have been completed. And this seems a little weird. A lot of people speculate on it. We don't have any other witness for what this can mean in any text I'm familiar with. But if you keep in mind how reality works, and we'd, we'd spoken about it, the stars move faster than the sun. So it could be that this one's preceded its place and is no longer what was you know, having that authority. I can't speak for certain. I really don't know. This is the next leader after him is Hela Emma Melek, whose name they call the Bright Sun. And all the days of his light are 91 days. And these are the days of signs upon signs upon the earth. This would be what summer manifests, okay? Scorching heat and drought. And trees will produce their glowing fruits and in part of their ripened ones. The sheep shall seek one another and become pregnant, and all the fruits of the earth are gathered in. And all that is in the fields as well as the winepress, these things shall take place in the days of his authority. And if you look on the Zadok calendar that Jerry Morris made, it has all the feasts for the new wine, the new oil. They, they all happen in summertime. And you finish with that last feast with the oil or, and then the wood the wood at the end with the week long, the sixth Yamim. And then right after that, you got about a week and a half before the fall festival start with the Chodesh of the seventh month we call Yom Teruah. It says, these are the names, the orders, and the subordinates of those captains over thousands. Gedel Yah, Hel Yael, and Kiel. And the name of that one that is added together with them is a captain over a thousand called Asphael. The days of the authority of this one have been completed. And it says, we are missing the last two seasons, but their effects can also be observed after the season starts. The meanings of the names of the leaders elucidate this as well. And basically you have after summer, you have fall with the corruption of the leaves that falling off the trees, the rotting away of some vegetation. So the last section here is confirming witnesses in scripture that support this view. Thank you for your time. And the rest of this will just go through. It's all scripture, both from the scriptures common to us all, and then parts from other places that confirm this calendar. This is once I have sworn by my set apartness, I do not lie to Dawid. His seed shall be forever and his throne as the sun before me. Like the moon, or the kingdom, it is established forever, and the witness in the Shamayim is steadfast. Excuse me. Now, I'd like to point out something real quick, and I'm not going to do this with every one of them, but the truth is always true and can never be contrary. So this is about the literal... Dawid or the King David as they call him 
And this is also about the beloved or foreshadowing of our Mashiach, because he was a type of him. His seed that shall be forever was literally his, his children that were going to continue in the world and sitting on the throne over the, over the Yisrael perpetually until our Mashiach comes and then he will be so because it was, it was said right here. But it's also his seed, which is the word, which he explains is the parable of all parables that shall be forever. And his throne, meaning our Mashiach, is as the sun before him. So these are all true in both contexts. And it really just takes time for you to, to read through these and to think about it, to know what is in the other parts of scripture, because it, it says that he speaks to everyone in parables. There is not a time that he's not speaking in parables, but his taught ones, the ones that draw near to him and seek answers and information from him alone about what is true and how to comprehend it, he reveals the secrets of the reign. And that is the, the meanings of the parables, the hidden meanings of his things in the word. That's what you can do with that creation parable as well. But we'll get to that another time. So he says, the witness in the Shamayim is steadfast, say law, or stop and think about it, like a pause in the music. And that's from Tehillim or Psalms 89, 35 through 37. Yahuwah, your loving kindness is in the Shamayim, and your trustworthiness reaches to the clouds. Psalms 36, 5. For this is the covenant I shall make with the house of Yisrael after those days, declares Yahuwah. I shall put my Torah in their inward parts and write it on their hearts. And I shall be their Elohim and they shall be my people. And no longer shall they teach each one his eth neighbor and each one his eth brother, saying, No eth Yahuwah. Aleph Tau Yahuwah, which is our Mashiach, for they shall all know me, and that word for me is OT, or my oath, literally, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares Yahuwah, for I shall forgive their crookedness and remember their sin no more. That oath is mentioned in the book of Hanok as that word that was begotten before creation, right? The Aleph Tau, or the firstborn of creation through whom all was made, literally the Hebrew language, but each letter of the Aleph bet lining up with each point of creation, all foretelling the future. It's an amazing thing, but it's not for, it's not the point right now. So the point right here is who's speaking and the fact that the witnesses in the Shamayim are trustworthy, right? But he says, thus said Yahuwah, who gives the sun for a light by day and the laws of the moon and the stars for a light by night or Lila, who stirs up the sea and its waves roar. Yahuwah of hosts is his name. If these laws vanish from before me, declares Yahuwah, then the seed of Yisrael shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Yeremiah 31, 33 through 36. And the word of Yahuwah came to Yahu, saying, Thus said Yahuwah, If you could break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, so that there be not Yom and Lila in their season, then my covenant could also be broken with Dawid my servant, so that he shall not have a son to reign upon his throne, and with the Luiim, the Kohanim, my attendants. As the host of the Shamayim is not counted, nor the sand of the sea measured, so I increase the descendants of Dawid, my servant, and the Luiim who attend upon me. And this is proof, this is evidence that the monarchies of the world, right, are of Yahuda, specifically those over the children of Israel, are of the seed of David. And again, you can see it in the emblems, the coats of arms of the monarchies throughout Europe. The British Isles has the crown lion with the shield of Dawid or the, the harp of Dawid with Ephraim chained to them. 
right? Ruling over the children of Yisrael. And that's the perpetual monarchy of the throne of Dawid to this day in fulfillment of this promise. And how that came about, you can read about in the Irish bard songs and the historical records after the Babylonian captivity, when Zadik Yahu or Zedekiah, as they say in English, was taken into captivity and his eyes were put out and his sons killed before him. His daughter was taken into Egypt or Mitzrayim. And from there, Yeremi Yahu took his youngest daughter, as foretold in the book of Yechezkiel or Ezekiel, and he took her to Ireland, where she married a son of Yahuda from the line of Zerah, who was known as the Iodahai. I can't say that name correctly, but he was the Hermon of Ireland or the largest land holder, <clears throat> rather, of Northern Ireland. And they got married and founded the kingdom of Ulster. And that, if you look at their emblem, it had the red hand for Zera and the Mogan Dawid, or the star of David, as they call it, for the line of Dawid reigning there. But it was through his, through the, a woman. And that same thing, they went over into Scotland and then down to England, where they reign today. His other line was also interjected through the Parthian dispersion into Europe that way with Odin and Freya. So there's a lot involved with that and how it came about. But Yahuwah gave the word and his promise first to Abraham, then to Yitzhak, then to Yaakov, and to Yaakov specifically in the book of Yobelim, he said, everywhere the, the feet of men have trodden, you'll have a son reigning. And then the kingdom or the the rain was given to Yahuda, and it was his children perpetually that, that are the rulers from that time as they spread out and go. And then from there, the, sea, the perpetual reign over the children was given to Dawid and his sons, which we can also see in fulfillment again, even to America, not to go on that too much, but in the Great Seal of America, you have the Mogan Dawid, because every president has been related and they're all of the children of Dawid, either through the mother or the father. But moving on. That was foreshadowed in scripture when Ezra came out of Babylon or when the children came out of Babylonian captivity and you had uh, Zerubbabel was no longer a monarch, but he was of the seed of Dawid as governor over the people. It's the same picture. When we came out of mystery, Babylonian captivity fled to the wilderness and we had governors over us instead of a monarchy. So getting back on point. It says, and the word of Yahuwah came to Yeremi Yahu saying, have you not observed what these people have spoken, saying the two clans which Yahuwah has chosen have been rejected by him? So they have despised my people no more to be a nation before them. Thus said Yahuwah, if my covenant is not with day and night, Yom and Lila, and if I have not appointed the laws of the Shemaim and earth, then I would also reject the descendants of Yaakov and Dawid, my servant, so that I should not take of his descendants to be rulers over the descendants of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, for I shall turn back their captivity and have compassion on them. Yirmiyahu 33, 19 through 26. All right, and then it says, this comprehension of the calendar was even taught by Kepha and his taught ones. And this is from the Recognitions of Clement, book eight, chapter, was that 45? Motions of the sun and moon. This is from one of Clement's older brothers, Aquila. He has a twin, but... This is after they were been instructed from Kepha for a while. He had encouraged them to speak in his presence, but not go beyond the things that they were taught from him. It says, uh, says Aquila, I will do so without delay. And he's talking in response to a question from his father at the time. It says, two visible signs are shown in the Shamayim, one of the sun the other of the moon, and these are followed by five other stars, each describing its own separate orbit. 
he, he says five because there was only five that are visible to the naked eye. Two of the seven planets, which are Greek for wanderers, two of the seven wandering stars you have to use optics to see, a telescope or something else. And that's reminiscent, by the way, with the assembly in Yerushalayim as a foreshadow. You had the 12 emissaries, like the 12 months, our Mashiach, like the sun, the, the kingdom that he set up, like the moon. And then the seven were like the seven ministers. Stephen was a martyr and Nicholas went apostate. So two are not visible. The five are. It's all a type and picture of what would be. But it says, these, therefore, Elohim has placed in the sky by which the temperature of the air may be regulated according to the seasons and the order of changes and alterations may be kept. But by means of the very same, if at any time he sends plague and corruption upon the earth for the sins of men, the air is disturbed, pestilence is brought upon animals, blight upon crops, and a destructive year in every way upon men. Thus it is that by one and the same means, order is both kept and destroyed. For it is clear even to the unbelieving and unskillful that the course of the sun, which is useful to the ne and necessary to the world, and which is... I'm sorry, just a moment. <clears throat> sorry about that. But to continue here, it says, Thus it is that by one and the same means, order is both kept and destroyed. For it is clear even to the unbelieving and unskillful that the course of the sun, which is useful and necessary to the world, and which is assigned by providence, is always kept orderly. But the courses of the moon, in comparison of the course of the sun, seems to the unskillful to be in oh, i'm sorry to be inordinate and unsettled in her waxings and wanings for the sun moves in fixed and orderly periods from for from him are hours are there not 12 hours in a yom our mashiach said which is using a sundial not not keeping a clock with the 24 hour period right from him the day when he rises, from him also the night when he, when he sets. From him months and years are reckoned. From him the variations of seasons are produced. While rising to the higher regions, when it's going north in its circuit, incrementally as the season goes, it's making a tighter and tighter circle as it goes north. And it also goes up in elevation, so it can be perceived by everyone, even though still in Australia. Um, that's why it looks like it goes higher in the sky. But it's a light. People don't, it's not an object that you can land on or touch. It's, it's a light. So moving on. And so for, for the sun moves in fixed and orderly periods, we already read that part. It says, from him are months and years are reckoned, and from him the variations of seasons are produced while rising to the higher regions or going north, he tempers the spring. But when he reaches the top of the Shemayim, he kindles the summer's heats, again sinking or heading south and going lower in elevation. He produces the temper of autumn, and when he returns to his lowest circle, the furthest circuit south, he bequeaths to us the rigor of winter's cold from the icy binding of the Shamayim, meaning that once he's in his furthest circuit, we get the winter cold coming in because the sun is pushing the cold from the Antarctic circle ahead of it, which I always thought was rather fascinating once I read this part. But that's not really the subject matter in question. It was to show that this is following the same pattern, the fixed movements of the sun, the inordinate to men's movements of the moon, and the fact that he is in control of all these things. Our Mashiach himself says the same thing, though, in parable form, where he's the light of the world, 
all authority was given to him, right? And then he breathes on his taught ones and he empowers the, those of his reign. In that very same fashion, without any deviation, that's how it works in reality. The power for things and how stuff works comes from the sun, which literally powers the moon and stars, which influence and all of them influence everything in creation, whether for benefit or for chastisement, if you will. And that was just alluded to right here. But that's also found in Josephus and other writings. It's not just in this one. <clears throat> so thank you all for your time. And we can do some questions here before wrapping it up. But that's what I have. So here we go.